Hello and welcome everybody. Um, welcome to National Youth Emphasis Weekend. Um, and I want to, uh, I'm Pastor Kevin, I'm the youth pastor here at Harvest Time Church. Um, and I wanted to share with you just a little bit before we start, um, a little bit about uh, TCSM. Some of you might be wondering, what are these four letters that I see all the time? Pastor Kevin talking about it, the students talking about it. TCSM stands for the Current Student Ministries. And we get this from John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, where Jesus says that if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And the current student ministries exist to provide Jesus to those that are thirsty. And those that come will receive Jesus. And out of them will flow these streams of living water, creating a current that will go across this region and eventually across this nation. We're praying that it goes and extends out to the nations. And so that is us. That's who we are. So when you hear TCSM, it's referring to the current student ministries, all right? All right, so everyone repeat after me, TCSM, TCSM. the current student ministries. All right. Well, to start us off today, we have uh, one of our amazing teenagers, an amazing student. Um, his name is Toussaint. Uh, and he came to us in the midst of the Greenwich outpouring, started, uh, started coming to the youth group. And uh, he wants to come, come on up to St. Let's welcome him as he comes. And he's going to share with us uh, a special piece that he, he prepared for our Fine Arts Festival about two weeks ago. Take it away to St. Good morning, everyone. Something in me's changed, and I promise you, it's not simple, so don't listen to this like another poem that will rub you the right way or like a band, crashing its symbols at an intensity that will have your heart burst into an array of excitement, or just because it tickles your fancy. Nor should you listen to this like a preacher who only gives you a message to satisfy your five senses and your complacence. See, this bit of information is intended to save someone in this room from a sea of regret that I have seen and that I have almost drowned in and that has caused me to give God only partially and that used to kill me and caused me to envy those who had it under control. Now, it... It's amazing how the simple word it encapsulates all that we as a group struggle with. How such a word pinpoints the exact sin that you and you and you are struggling with and are ashamed of telling anyone. And the worst part about it is that we are afraid of even telling our Father in heaven, who is forever ready to pour down from heaven what is necessary and drown you in his power to save you from drowning in the sin that you give power to. Until now, I had no hope or faith of beating it. I was filled with unbelief. And as hard as it is to admit, God's standard was much higher than the bar that it had set. Much higher than the bar that it had set. I was always defeated. I asked for forgiveness and asked for forgiveness and asked for forgiveness again, but would enter every city, clinging to my life with all that I could and putting all my faith in my abilities, just as any average person would until one day, boom. I stepped away from my past. I quit letting the size of it cause my faith to be in contrast to the kind of faith that lasts. The kind of faith that 1 Corinthians 15, 58 calls steadfast. The unshakable kind that I began to cling to. The kind of faith that I put into the God that broke into my heart when my whole life was broken in two. I was transformed into a peculiar person, unparalleled by eternal perdition, and I entered the city that God built from the ruins of my past, letting everyone know that he's able to do it for more than just me, that in this moment, in this city, wherever or whatever it may be, that you're not exempt from his mercy, because he was beaten, and I can imagine brought to his knees, but what I can't imagine is why he would do it for me. Because God knows that I love his freedom, but who in the world would give up their son, their only son, to take away the pain by taking the pain? 
and I can imagine the tears that seep from his eyes as he looked in the city, into the cities of your past ruins, your it that has continuously fed you lies and declared in dying breath to clear all confusions. Your it was included and forever diminished when Jesus Christ cried out, it is finished. Thank you. I love watching clips of people hurting themselves. Blame it on my cynical sense of humor. Call it sarcasm, call it the vicarious living of an adrenaline junkie, or even justifying it by being a reckless youth pastor. Call it what you want. I love watching shows like Ridiculousness, Impractical Jokers, and a timeless favorite, America's Funniest Home Videos. If I'm not careful today, I might have the special opportunity to be on one of those shows. Today is National Youth Emphasis Weekend, and I want to share with you a story that seems like a clip from AFV. It's the account of a long-winded conversationalist and a young boy. It's the story of a crowded room and three stories high. It's the eyewitness of a testimony of a doctor who pronounced the young boy dead at the scene. And it's the story of Eutychus, a young boy who falls dead from three stories high at one of Paul's sermons. And you can read that story with me in Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 12. Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 12. I'll give you some time to flip there while my eyes adjust. <laughs> Verse 7 says, On the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep, and he fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled. For his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak. And then he left. They took away the boy alive, and they were greatly comforted. In high school, there was one class that I dreaded going to. It was biology. Not because I didn't like the material or anything like that. It was because I had probably the most boring teacher that could have ever been. Her name even sounds like a teacher that would be boring. Ms. Bledgy. <laughs> Forgive me, Ms. Bledgy, if you ever see this, I'm sorry. So I would use her biology class, and I'm sure I'm the only one in this room that has ever done this, but I would use the time in her class, instead of learning biology, I would use it as my nap time. <laughs> I, would, I would prop up my biology book in front of my face, lean my head down on the desk, maybe even flip my hood over my head and snooze off. And it wasn't a secret that I did this either because I had, I had the seat that was front and center of the classroom. So in her plain view, I would just be there 
sleeping in my hoodie. I remember one time specifically in this classroom that I decided I was going to go for a nap and and I was laying there kind of resting and, and in the desk I had that feeling. You know the feeling. Between half asleep and half awake, the feeling of free falling. And as I was there, as she's in the front lecturing and I'm half asleep and half awake, the fear and fright of falling and hitting the ground came over me and I jumped up. And it was so dramatic, I even, I even kicked out the chair from behind me, smacked into the desk behind me. And, and realizing what I had done in the middle of her lecture, I looked up, frightened, and said, uh, I got to go to the bathroom. And I grabbed the hall pass off the chalkboard and ran out of the room, bug-eyed and embarrassed. For Eutychus, this was no dream. Eutychus in his early teenage years, attended a farewell address from the Apostle Paul. Certainly, he had just come in from his work day, and he attended this well-known teacher's service with his parents. The room was pretty crowded. It was moving late into the evening, and the stuffiness of the air became quite thick. The torches in the room, which were to give light to the darkness of night, were beginning to snuff out the oxygen in the atmosphere. The flickering light from the flames seemed to lure poor Eutychus into a zombie-like state of drowsiness. As Eutychus sat on the window's edge, fighting off the sleep that was swiftly coming upon him, slowly but surely the enticing comfort of sleep overcame Eutychus. Unknown to those around, Eutychus fell asleep in church. And in a true life rendition of a comical situation, Eutychus fell from three stories up, plummeting to his death. Through Eutychus' story, I believe that the church can learn something of great importance today. The church can learn that the time to invest in our teenagers is now. I bring you today three reasons why the time to invest in our teenagers is now. Number one, because we cannot afford to have our teenagers falling asleep in church. (laughs) A few weeks ago, I almost caught one of our beloved teenagers drifting off to sleep. Head back, mouth wide open. I even thought I saw a little bit of drool coming out of the corner of his mouth. And as I leaned back with my phone, I leaned back just as I was about to snap a picture of this young boy sleeping in church so I can post it online and embarrass him. He woke up shook himself awake, and started nodding in agreement with the sermon. (laughs) I missed it by fractions of a second. Although this biblical account is speaking of Eutychus' physical sleep, our students run the risk of falling into a spiritual slumber at churches that do not invest into the teenagers. All across the United States, teenagers are falling asleep in church. Kendra Creasy Dean makes a very good observation in her book, OMG, a youth ministry handbook. She notes that it was very strange Eutychus was sitting in a window on the outskirts of the congregation. Why was this young man not among the crowd listening intently to the Apostle Paul? He could have been sitting right at the apostles' feet, but instead 
he went unnoticed in a back corner. The lack of involvement of this young boy in the service and the discussion that took place caused a barrier between him, the adults, and the speaker that allowed sleep to overcome him. In the American church, a plague has caught on and invaded the thinking of many adults. In countless church services across this nation, the teenagers are neglected. Teenagers are not stepping into their identity in the congregation. I used to travel around all over and speak and, and take part in different services. And I've heard pastors, and I've even read, I've, I've heard pastors say this, an encouraging word to the teenagers and to the congregation. Our teenagers are the church of tomorrow. And although many people clap and amen this statement, I cringe in disagreement. Church, I do not believe that the teenagers are the church of tomorrow. Teenagers are the church of today. Yeah. Our students come alive in their teenage years. They become a great influence in their communities, schools, and in many ways, they are more open to minister in new, creative, outside-of-the-box thinking than those who consider themselves older, seasoned, and more dignified. Sometimes our students are a better way of communicating these new, fresh ideas in evangelism than those that have been in the church for quite some time. Teenagers are the church's missionaries and pastors. Teenagers are missionaries to the biggest mission field in this nation, their schools. And they are pastors to the various students within those schools and their communities. The various Christians that are in those schools, in those Bible clubs, and in their communities, they are pastors to these other students. We cannot continue to consider the students less than the church of today. To say that they are the church of tomorrow is to say that they are a less important and less honorable segment of the body of Christ. When in reality, Scripture says that we are all a part of the body of Christ and each member has a specific purpose for it. And so when we neglect including the teenagers in the church of today, we speak negativity into their ears. When we call them the church of tomorrow, our students hear that they're not really capable of having any real impact just yet. We refer to our teenagers of the church of tomorrow while they sit in the seats today, ready to make an impact on the kingdom of God. Our teenagers are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. If we're not investing into the lives of our teenagers, we set them up for failure. We leave them on the outskirts of the congregation and, so, and soon they begin to lull into a spiritual sleep of stale air. Soon the excitement of salvation becomes dull. Soon the, the, the thrill of a transformed life makes the dreaded transition from something like skydiving to jumping off the curb of a sidewalk. Church services go from having real-world application to a forced ritual that has no spiritual takeaway. Our teenagers are falling asleep in the church. This spiritual slumber halts teenagers in their tracks. And until we take a personal investment in the teenagers of today's church, this sleep will continue to spread Contagiously like a yawn 
and a spiritual slumber will overcome this generation as they sit at the windowsill. Three reasons why the time to invest in our teenagers is now. Number one, because we can't afford to have our teenagers falling asleep in church. And two is because for too long our students have been falling out of the windows of the church. Not too long ago, I shared with the teenagers a startling statistic. In our Catalyst Discipleship class, I shared with them that studies show that all across denominations across America, whether Protestant or Catholic, collectively, the American church, only 20% of all teenagers that graduate out of a youth group will continue to be going to religious services two years after leaving that youth group. This means that 80% of all students in America that grow up in the church. I'm not talking about other students who don't attend church. I'm talking about students that grow up in the church, that have a religious background. 80% of them, after leaving a youth group, will deny any form of organized religion altogether. I want you to take a look down your row and imagine that everyone in this place is a teenager. And all these seats are completely filled with students. I want you to look down your row and this statistic means that out of your row, if everyone in this room were teenagers and all the seats were filled, your seat and the seat next to you would be the only two seats that were still Christians after two years of graduating from a youth group. The other eight or nine sitting next to you, they go to college, they go to the workplace, the military, or get married and disappear from the church. They fall out of the windows. As you might imagine, this came as quite a shock to some of our students. One well-intentioned teenager said, can't we just all be positive? Can, can we say that we'll still all be going to... Can, can't we just... Can't every one of us still be following Christ after high school? Her heartbreak and her sincerity for her generation broke my heart again for the students. She was so concerned and sincere that she wanted to see all of her friends still following Christ after high school broke my heart again for this generation. But I couldn't look at these statistics and assume that, well, for us, it's just going to be different. I responded to her and said, it was my prayer. It's my heart that we keep our students after graduation. That's the goal of why I'm here. But I said it's only going to happen. With strong biblical discipleship. I hate to bring bad news to the church today. But I cannot look at this generation. And the statistics that surround them. And stand up here in front of you. And lie. Our teenagers are falling asleep. And it's causing them to fall out of the windows of the church. Published sociologists Mark Regnerus and Jeremy Wecker did a study on this phenomenon of falling out of the windows of the church. In their study, they concluded, quote, that this is often the result, the falling out of the windows of the church, this is often the result of processes set in motion long before young people ever set foot on a college campus. Those students who lose their faith in college or drop out of organized religion after high school are primarily those already at considerable risk of doing so. Get this, for reasons that precede and predate these actions. What does this mean for us? What does this study show? It shows that long before they graduate high school, there is something that has to happen in a teenager's life 
that will determine whether they truly take on belief and continue in the faith or decide, well, it's not worth my time, and then they leave organized religion. Though I come with some bad news today, I also come with a glimmer of hope. According to this study, if something happens in their formative teenage years that bolster or support their commitment to Christ, teenagers, when they encounter troubled times after graduating, they will not crumble under the pressure. They will not run from their faith, and they will not fall out the windows of the church. If we do not invest our time and efforts into our teenagers, we will continue to see the church spiral down this lost generation of leaving the church windows and spiral downward into oblivion. We need to invest in this generation. Strong discipleship and mentorship is the answer to the problems that we face. The hope of this generation rests on the young men being mentored by older men of the church and young women being mentored by older women of the church. We need the congregation to come together. We need the whole of the congregation to come alongside the Eutychuses of this generation and grab them as they're sitting at the windowsills of the church and pull them closer. We need the congregation to pull them closer to the congregation, closer to sit at the apostles' feet and ever more closer to Jesus Christ. We need the congregation to pray for poor Eutychus. That he'll stay awake and he will not fall. The future of the church depends on the church of today, our students. The time to invest in our teenagers is now. Because for too long, they have been falling out the windows of the church. Three reasons why the time to invest in our teenagers is now. Number one, because we can't afford to have our teenagers falling asleep in church. Number two, because for too long our teenagers have been falling out the windows of the church. And number three, because they are destined by God to do great things. It seems that Eutychus had stepped out of his destiny that God had promised him through his name. Ironically, Eutychus means one of good fortune or hitting the mark. And at his young age, Eutychus happened to hit the mark as he dropped out of the window to the ground below as if there were a target underneath him. Eutychus hit the mark. Luke offers a detailed observation as a doctor that he was picked up dead from the ground below. Paul ran to him in a manner only seen exercised before by Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament and throws himself headlong over the boy, embraces him, picks him up, and says, Do not be afraid, for his life is in him. Eutychus almost lost all God had in store for him. This one of good fortune was brought back to life because God destined him to do great things and his future was to be blessed. In our church today, we have many Eutychuses. When I first came up here, I introduced to you our student, to Saint, who came and delivered a spoken word or dramatic reading of poetry. He performed this piece at District Fine Arts two weekends ago, and he's coming with us to Nationals at Orlando, Florida in August. Coming up is another student of ours, David Vogel, who also qualified for Nationals with his original piece, 
that he's going to perform for us right now. This is my original song called um, With My Heart. So my spirit grows within me. The time to invest in our teenagers is now because God has destined them to do great things.
want to have all of our students who participated in fine arts to go ahead and stand up where you are right now. I, I haven't even gotten to the good part yet. Out of 13 teenagers who participated in district fine arts, all of them qualified for nationals. That's something to celebrate. We also have seven students who are part of the TCS movement, which is our Bible Club initiative. It's our Bible Club initiative, which is to enhance, resurrect, and develop Bible clubs in every school represented by our teenagers. If you're here, if you're a teenager and you're here and you take part in TCS movement, if you could stand up for me. These students have taken a five-fold commitment in their high schools to pray, live, tell, serve, and give selflessly at their schools. Three schools represented here have already started new Christian Bible clubs, and we're looking to add three more next year. Last Wednesday... We had 15 students sign up for TC Servant Ministry, headed up by Sherry Ann. This ministry is our community service initiative. 15 of our teenagers have decided that they want to commit to doing community service projects all across this region. If you're here and you signed up for TC Servant Ministry, you can go ahead and stand up. We also have others that have pledged to give towards missions this year. As a whole, our youth group, we have, as a youth group, we've set a goal for missions to raise $12,500. We have students who have pledged to give certain amounts for monthly throughout this entire year. Some of you might ask, Pastor Kevin, what is that weird thing growing out the side of your head? Those of you that are Star Wars fans will know that this is technically called a Padawan braid or a Jedi braid. And I made a deal with the teenagers. I said, I will continue to grow my Jedi braid out long until you raise the $12,500 for missions. So if you want your youth pastor to not look like a goofball, raise the money. If you want this thing coming out the side of my head to be gone, raise the money. All of those that gave pledges, if you haven't stood already, you can stand. All students in this place, if you're from 13 to 18, I want you to stand all across this room. If you're a part of TCSM on Wednesdays, Sundays, or if you've never been a part of TCSM before, I want you to stand up. We need to honor our students who have taken up. Please stay standing just for a few more minutes, students. These students take the challenge to become disciples through Catalyst Discipleship on Sunday mornings, through our Wednesday night program. And even there are some of those here that haven't been to them because they love to come to the services here on Sunday mornings and listen to Pastor Glenn. Teenagers, you're more than welcome to join us for any of these services. And these students, all of you in this room, have, have taken a commitment to become disciples. Every teenager, I want you to look at me up here. I have to tell you that God has destined you to do great things. You are called to be a Eutychus. God's plans and thoughts towards you are good. And everything he thinks, the vastness of his thoughts towards you are good. 
He desires a closeness with you. And he has in store for you a destiny to change and transform society. You are the church of today, not tomorrow. Thank you. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Beloved church, here in your presence today are teenagers who God has destined for greatness and a promising future. The time to invest in our teenagers is now. If the worship team can make their way forward. So if the time to invest in our teenagers is now, what can you do? How can you invest into their lives? Today, I'm going to give you four suggestions as to how you can invest into the lives of our teenagers. Number one, what you can do to invest into the lives of our teenagers is simply this. Greet them. Shake their hand. Get to know them. You see, sometimes teenagers just want to feel a part of something. And it's our job as the entire body of Christ to welcome them into their role of being a part of the church of today. If you don't know their name, ask them. And get to know them. Welcome them. Say hello as they come into the church. Welcome our students as they come. Number two, what you can do is you can encourage them and have patience with them. Our students are still figuring out who they are in Christ and what they want to do in life and how they're going to make an impact. Our students are still figuring out life and sometimes they just need a little bit of encouragement from those that have been there before to say, I'm proud of you. I'm thankful that God has sent you in this place and I'm standing behind you and standing with you. So encourage our students. They face so much in their schools today, in the communities today. Sometimes it's unthinkable to hear what happens inside the school walls. And sometimes they just need you to encourage them in Christ. Number one, welcome them, get to know them, invite them in. Number two, encourage them and have patience. And number three, what you can do to invest into the lives of these students is become a mentor to one of these students. Become a mentor. It's not for everybody, but if you can invest time and energy into the lives of students, I welcome you to do so. We need the older men mentoring the young men and we need the older women mentoring the younger women because through that we can raise up a generation of game changers. We can raise up a generation of influencers that can radically change this nation. If you wish to become a mentor to a teenager, it's really not that difficult. Attach yourself to them. Invite them over with their parents' permission for dinner. Talk with the parents. Be a part of their lives. Throw yourself into their life. Talk. Listen. Spend time. And if you wish to be a mentor, I encourage you. In, in our Catalyst Discipleship class downstairs at the 10 o'clock service, we're going over leadership development and mentorship. And I welcome you to come and join us as we learn some of these things so that we can equip you as to how to be a mentor to a teenager. Number one, greet them, welcome them, bring them into the church body. Number two, encourage them, have patience. Number three, become a mentor to a teenager. And number four, and the easiest one that everybody in this building can do is pray take part in prayer zone partners I have this sticker and every single one of you is going to get it as you leave today it's a, it's a window sticker 
And what you do is you peel this off and you place it on the front windshield of your car facing you. And it looks kind of like a sign that you see on the, on the roads quite a bit. It looks like a school zone sign. It's prayer zone partners. And it, this sticker marks as a reminder to you that every time you pass by a school, every time you go through, you're driving through a school zone, drive down King Street, you'll pass about seven. Every time you drive past a school zone, say a prayer for the students in those schools. Say a prayer. Whether you know what school, what students go to that school or you don't, it doesn't matter. Pray for students in the schools. Whether it's an elementary school, junior high, high school, college, or university, pray for the students in those schools. The church of today needs your prayers more than anything else. And every time you pass through a school zone, no matter what school it is, this sticker serves as a reminder for you to pray for our students. Pray that God would raise them up as leaders in their school. Pray that they would have favor with administration to start up Bible clubs. Pray that whoever walks into that school, young or old, Christian or pre-Christian, will feel the presence of God overwhelm them as they enter into the doorways of that school. Those who believe in that school will stand firm throughout their days there and be missionaries to the greatest mission field in this country and around the world. Before I hand over the mic to Pastor Nick to close us out, I want us to stretch our hands towards our students and say a prayer of blessing over them. Students, if I could have you stand just one more time. And those of you that are in here, if you see a student around you, lay a hand on their shoulder. And all of us, let's just put our hands towards the students. Don't forget the students up here on stage. And let's join in agreement and pray a blessing over our teenagers. Father God, right now, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, a blessing over every student in this place. We pray, oh God, that you would awaken them from a spiritual slumber. Make them alive. Breathe a fresh breath of awakening into their hearts. By your Holy Spirit, God, would you bring them awake and motivate them by your presence. God, we extend out a blessing over their lives. Empower them with boldness. Empower them with your spirit. Empower them with the presence of God as they go into their schools and communities and have an impactful force wherever they go. God, I pray that none of them would fall out of the windows of the church. That we will look back 10, 15, 20 years from now and see that every teenager that has gone through the doors of this church is still following Jesus Christ years into their adulthood. That their families that they have in 20, 10, 15, 20 years will be families that are faithful to you. We pray that they would be kept within the church and not fall out of our windows. I pray that they would realize the potential that they have in you to do great things, that you've destined them for greatness. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, and I believe that the students of this youth group, of this church, will not be another statistic, but that they will break through every preconceived idea about this generation. That they will break through every negative thing that the world would say about this generation. That they would rise up as leaders, triumphant, more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. So Father, right now we extend a blessing in the name of Jesus. We thank you and praise you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we welcome them into the church of today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's show our appreciation to Pastor Kevin and just give thanks to the Lord for that great word today. I don't think we've ever had anybody climb in through the window on a ladder. To st- don't expect that for me when I'm preaching in two weeks, okay? We're so thankful for our teens and for how they've ministered today. And uh, we're going to do one more thing before we leave this morning. We're going to take an offering for our youth group, and we want to give you an opportunity to sow into the lives and ministries of 